Winona, Mississippi, a small town of roughly 5,000 people where not many things out of the ordinary happen. However, one early morning of July 1996, tragedy would shake the lives of everyone in town. Four employees of the Tardy Furniture Store were found dead in pools of their own blood. They had all been shot in the head. After an unsuccessful investigation with little to no evidence, the police made an arrest based on the testimonies of two bystanders and circumstantial evidence. Curtis Flowers, an ex-employee of the store, was arrested and charged with the four murders. But after a 20-year-long legal battle and six trials full of inconsistencies, Curtis Flowers, who maintained his innocence all along, was cleared. So, if Flowers was innocent, who committed the Tardy Furniture Store murders? And can this cold case ever be solved? For 50 years, Sam Jones had worked at the Tardy Furniture Store in Winona, Mississippi. He knew the owners and kept a close relation to them even after his working days were over. So when Bertha Tardy, the store owner, had asked if he could come in and help train the two new delivery employees, Sam gladly accepted. After parking his car outside the store at around 10 in the morning, he entered through the doors he'd crossed for so many years. However, what he stumbled upon was nothing like he'd ever seen before. Four employees, including Bertha, the store owner, were scattered around different parts of the store. Blood surrounded all the bodies, and as he listened closely, he heard the sound of what he described as someone trying to catch their breath. Lying on the floor in a pool of blood, he found Derek Stewart, also known around town as Bobo, one of the new delivery guys he was going to help train. Bobo was 16 years old. Sam Jones was in disbelief, but he pulled himself together, ran to another store nearby, and asked the woman to call 911. By 10.20 in the morning, the police were in the store calling for backup and medical services. The Tardy Furniture Store was officially declared a crime scene. Tardy Furniture was part of Winona's Front Street stores. The shop had been opened in the 1940s, when Winona's downtown was packed with shoppers daily. The original owner, Tom Tardy, had founded the shop after serving in World War II. After working together for years, in 1985, Tom sold the business to the in-store decorator Bertha, but still went into the store almost daily. The two would eventually marry. Over the years, the downtown area of Winona, like many others across America, had lost a lot of population. People were no longer shopping in town, but going to malls. However, despite many other stores closing in Front Street, Tardy Furniture was still standing and showcasing country-style furniture. All of this changed after July 16, 1996. When backup arrived at the scene, the police scouted the shop to make sure the killer wasn't still inside. After confirming the store was empty, the crime scene investigation began. There were four bodies on the floor. Bobo, the teenage delivery boy, who had only been working at Tardy Furniture for a few days, was rushed to the hospital. However, he would die a few hours later. The other three victims were also employees of the store. Bertha Tardy was the owner, and had been working at Tardy Furniture for over 50 years. Carmen Rigby had worked at Tardy Furniture for 20 years, taking care of bookkeeping and many other managing tasks. Robert Golden had just been hired as a delivery guy, and was about to receive his training from Sam Jones. It was his first day working at Tardy Furniture. The four victims had each been shot in the head. Two bullets, two bullet fragments, and five shell casings were recovered. A set of footprints was found, matching a Fila sneaker, which neither Sam Jones, the man who found the bodies, or any of the victims were wearing. The cash register only had some coins in it, but as it was the start of the day, it's possible the register had been cleared the previous night before closing. 
Bertha's handbag was sitting on top of a chair, with all of its contents still inside. The store's safe wasn't locked, but it hadn't been emptied. It didn't seem to be a robbery. Although the police were quick to begin an investigation of the scene, there was little to no control of the access. People walked in and out at the most crucial moment of evidence recovery, and the scene was contaminated almost immediately. DNA and fingerprint samples returned no results. All they could lead with were the shoe print and the bullets. With barely any substantial evidence and with no witnesses of the crime, the police began to get anxious. The town was worried. Things like this didn't happen in Winona, and the residents were restless. There was a lot of pressure to find the killer, but investigators had no leads. The four people who had been brought in for questioning had been released, and every time someone's story checked out, the police were back to square one. The investigation had been open for months, and barely any progress was made, so the police began looking into the testimonies of witnesses who were in the area at the time. Upon questioning some people, a name came up. Curtis Flowers. Curtis Giovanni Flowers had been working at Tardy Furniture up until two weeks before the murders. The word was that he'd been fired from the store after dropping a crate he was moving, and that he owed Bertha $30. His uncle's gun had been stolen from his car the same day the murders took place, and during the morning of July 16th, two people claimed they'd seen him around the area. Investigators used these details to build a narrative, Curtis was mad that he'd been fired and had decided to kill his former employer. This is what they built the case on. And so, Curtis was arrested and charged with the murder of the four people found at the Tardy Furniture Store. From 1997 to 2010, Curtis would be tried six times for the Tardy Furniture Store murders. In the first trial, the prosecutor based his arguments on the shoe print found at the scene, which was the same size as Flower's shoe size, and the bullets recovered, which matched the gun stolen from his uncle's car that same morning. Witnesses also claimed they'd seen an African-American man at the scene wearing the same model of Fila shoes which left the print at the scene. They had identified him as Curtis Flowers over a month later using a photo lineup of six African-American men. Although nothing pointed directly at Curtis, since neither the shoe nor the murder weapon had been recovered, the jury still found him guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Curtis appealed, and the verdict was overturned by the Mississippi Supreme Court because evidence from the other murders was being admitted into the trial of Bertha Tardy, and because the prosecutor had asked questions, quote, not in good faith, and without basis in fact meaning the questions and the narrative were being built to lead the story to the guilt of Curtis instead of proving it through the evidence itself. The second trial resulted in another death sentence, but it was appealed and overturned for the same reasons it was appealed in the first trial. When the third trial came along, another issue surfaced. The prosecutor, who was the same in all three trials, was suspected of deliberately striking off African-American citizens from the jury. During the first trial, the jury was all white, and in the second trial, there was only one African-American member. After the third trial resulted in another conviction for Flowers, the Mississippi Supreme Court determined there was a strong case of racial discrimination, particularly in the efforts the district attorney was making to keep the jury mostly white. Therefore, the conviction was once again overturned. After the accusations of racial discrimination, the prosecution included five African-American members in the jury of the fourth trial. And this time, there was no conviction. The jury was split, so it ended in a mistrial. The same thing happened in the fifth trial. The jury couldn't reach a verdict. In 2010, and after over 10 years of trials, the jury of the sixth trial found Curtis Flowers guilty, and the death sentence was back on the table. Curtis appealed, but this time, the Mississippi Supreme Court decided the conviction would be upheld. After the Mississippi Supreme Court denied Curtis's appeal, the United States Supreme Court revised the case. In 2016, 
Curtis Flowers' case was reviewed for a racial bias by the prosecution and jury selection. However, his conviction was affirmed once again. When everything seemed to be decided for Curtis after two decades of trying to prove his innocence, something happened which changed his fate completely. And that something was a podcast. Madeline Barron is a journalist who hosts the American public media podcast In the Dark. She became extremely interested in the case and dove into everything that happened since that morning in 1996. After a thorough investigation of all the evidence, the testimonies, the police work and the trials, Madeline dedicated the second season of In the Dark to all the inconsistencies in the witness reports, the racial discrimination of the trials and the lack of solid proof that Curtis Flowers had committed the Tardy Furniture Store murders. The podcast didn't just bring a lot of attention to the case. Madeline Barron's investigation uncovered new evidence which Curtis Flowers' lawyers were able to use to ask for another review of the conviction. It turns out, Curtis had not been fired from Tarney Furniture. In fact, he claimed to have parted in good terms with Bertha. At the time of the murders, Bertha owed Curtis around $50 from his last paycheck. $50 doesn't seem like a strong enough motive to commit a quadruple homicide. In the dark also retraced Curtis's steps that morning, based on the testimonies given when he was first questioned. He claimed he was at his sister's house, but the prosecutors offered a different route based on where the witnesses claimed to have seen him to fit the time frame and prove he could have gone from his house to steal the gun, then back to his house and then to the store to commit the murders. The route was so complicated and exposed him so much to potentially being spotted that it made no sense. It was just used to build a narrative by the prosecutors. The witness testimonies were also brought up in the podcast. After claiming they had seen him that day, several witnesses changed their stories or expressed doubts about whether or not it was actually Curtis they saw. In fact, those who picked him out of a photo lineup did so a month after the murders. Experts on eyewitness memory express how easy it is to fail to recognize someone you've only seen for a brief moment, especially if so much time has gone by. The podcast episodes really shone a light on all the questionable evidence in the police work done back in 1996, and after several arguments were presented, the United States Supreme Court overturned Curtis Flowers' conviction based on the argument that the prosecutor had also made an effort to keep the jury as white as possible, knowing by this point the case was heavily influenced by race. By December of 2019, and seeing how the case against him was growing weaker and weaker, Curtis Flowers was granted bail and was limited to house arrest. The DA who had tried Flowers six times stepped down from the case in January 2020, and the state decided that he would not be tried a seventh time. On September 4th of 2020, the Attorney General's office dropped all charges against Curtis Flowers, stating the witness reports from 1996 were no longer valid. They had been changed so many times and were so conflicting with the new evidence uncovered by In the Dark that they were useless by this point. The case was dismissed with prejudice, so Curtis Flowers was officially a free man. If you're interested in learning all the details of the case, I highly recommend you listen to this podcast. The level of detail and the amount of work put into it is just incredible and completely worth your time if you want to dive deeper into it. So if Curtis Flowers didn't commit the murders at the Tardy Furniture Store, who did? Well, the truth is, nobody knows. A case like this, in a town so small, puts the police in the spotlight. People want to feel safe again, and won't until someone is behind bars. The bad handling of the crime scene, the poor interviews with potential witnesses, the racial discrimination… It's not that they had reason to believe Curtis Flowers was guilty, it's that they needed to believe they had the guy so the case could be closed as soon as possible, and everything could go back to normal. But thanks to the work of a reporter, more facts came out. There was much more evidence proving Curtis's innocence than there was proving he was guilty. In fact, the police had stated there were never more suspects, but in the dark uncovered that there were. A man wearing the same feelers as the ones found at the crime scene was also seen in the area by witnesses on that same day. The man even confirmed to Madeline that he was considered a suspect for a brief time. However, he was eventually released. The truth is, to this day, we still don't know who decided to end the lives of Bertha, Carmen, Robert and Bobo. And considering it's been 25 years, we may never find out. 
The reason behind their cruel death is still a mystery. A mystery that made a man have to fight for his life for two decades. Like I mentioned earlier, I really recommend you give In the Dark a listen, especially if you enjoy deep dives into cases, and I hope you can find it as fascinating as I did. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content like this, make sure you're subscribed to the back of the archive. As always, thank you so much for watching.